Usaka Sakabo, and welcome to part three of the Caciques and Semi Idols, the web spun by Taino rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. Read aloud. Um, last week we left off on chapter four, so that's where we're going to start today. So, chapter four is personhood and the animistic Amerindian perspective. Before proceeding to flesh out the contents and relationships between human beings who express Tainones and these other things imbued with semi-power, it is useful to first discuss what is meant by the terms, quote, person, end quote, and, quote, personhood, end quote, especially because there have not yet been contemplated in analyses of Caribbean material culture. Here I follow very closely the notions of person and personhood discussed by Chris Fowler in his excellent book, The Archaeology of Personhood, Fowler produced a very useful table in which he compares the animistic, totemic, and naturalistic worldview perspectives, each with its own particular modes of personhood construction. This table should be consulted as I develop the arguments to follow below. For copyright reasons, it's not reproduced here. A person is a, quote, entity, any entity, human or otherwise, that may be conceptualized and treated as a person, end quote, while personhood refers to the, end quote, condition or state of being of a person as, as it is understood in any specific context. Persons are constituted or constructed, deconstituted, maintained, altered, and transformed in social practices through life and death, end quote. Fowler goes on to say that, end quote, exactly who or what may or may not be a person is contextually variable, end quote. And of course, what each person is, is very much dependent on the interrelationships with other human beings and with other beings and things. Quote, personhood is attained and maintained through relationships, not only with human beings, but with things, places, animals, and the spiritual features of the cosmos. Some of these may also emerge as persons through this engagement. People's own social interpretations of personhood and the social practices through which personhood is realized shape their intentions, and I would add motivations, in a reflexive way. But personhood remains a mutually constituted condition, end quote. Personhood is not, therefore, a cumulative set of fixed, distinguishing personality traits, Rather, as Fowler noted, the life and afterlife of a person is an ongoing process where, quote, personhood of different kinds is sought, struggled with, and attained, end quote. Personhood is, in effect, the state of being rather than the process per se, but, quote, the process of becoming a person is vital to the state of being of a person, end quote, and thus, quote, personhood deals with that process, end quote. And in, an animist, blah, blah, blah. and in an animistic world, persons in personhood include not just human, but also other beings and things. Persons are constantly evolving and changing. One might detect particular phases of changes in personhood status, such as those captured, by, captured in Arnold Van Gennep's famous Rites de, Pas, um, Rites de Passage. I don't know. The broad and flexible definitions of person and pers personhood set up a framework in which to approach the analysis of the interaction between iconic artifacts imbued with semi and the Taino human beings that socially engaged them. Following Fowler and others, there are three basic modes or fields of personhood, animism, totemism, and naturalism. These refer to the forms that person and personhood relationships, quote, are supposed to take, end quote. But in order to address these fields or modes in relation to person and personhood, it's necessary to first define several key concepts that, in Fowler's words, quote, describe the overarching, lo overarching logic of being a person within any social context and in the specific long-term trends in the practices that support that logic. People actively engage with these trends and with that particular concept or mode of personhood when they pursue strategies of interaction. As a result of these interactions, each person is constructed in a specific way, end quote. The first set of features of personhood that need to be defined relate to the contrastive notions of individual, individuality, and indivisibility on one hand, and of individual and individuality on the other. As might be intuitively guessed, 
Individuality refers to the common concept of personal uniqueness that all persons have. As Fowler noted in common usage, quote, all people are individuals, end quote but it does not follow that individuals have an indivisible nature. Indivisibility refers to a state of being indivisible, whole, a unitary person. This state of indivisibility is the prevalent contemporary, quote, Western mode, end quote, of personhood identity, where, quote, individuality lies at the core of a fixed and constant sense of self, end quote, a sense of personal identity, and where the individuality is, quote, stressed over relational identities, end quote. Persons can alternatively be conceived as individual rather than individual persons. Dividuality refers to a state where the person and its body, the individual, is acknowledged to be, quote, composite and multi-authored, end quote, where persons engaged in social relationships with other beings and things, quote, owe parts of themselves to others, end quote, and where the person is composed of traits or features that may have different origins or authorships, such as the mind, soul, and body. Some of these features that make up personhood are not necessarily fixed in the body. They can also, for example, temporarily or permanently enter or exit or pass through the body. Changes in the different elements that constitute a body thus change its balance and, quote, alter the disposition of the person, end quote. Partability is one formal expression of the individual person and personhood. As the term applies, it refers to the reconfiguration of the individual person such that one part or element can be subtracted and given to another person or entity to which it is owed. Being a, quote, multiply constituted, end quote, person composed of diverse relations makes him, her, or it, quote, a partable entity, an agent that can dispose of parts or act as a part. Thus, example, Melanesian women move in marriage as parts of clans, thus men circulate objectified parts of themselves among themselves, end quote. Permeability is another formal expression of the individual person and refers to a state whereby the person can be suffused or, quote, permeated by qualities that influence the internal composition of the person, end quote. Melanesian societies are often cited as prime examples of partable persons, while Hindu societies are exemplars of permeable persons. In the last decade or so, other examples of individuality have also emerged. For the ancient Maya, there are analyses of the various modes of constructing and conceptualizing persons and personhood, and research ranges from topics such as the performance of the body and mortuary rituals, to illuminating cross comparisons of quote embodied lives end quote between Maya and Egyptian civilizations and their different ways of constructing self and others through theories of embodiment. The individual and partable character of persons among natives engaged in expressing their tainones is sufficiently documented by the 16th century Spanish chroniclers. To take one example among many, Fray Ramón Pané details how the Bejiques in Hispaniola cured illness from the body of a patient whose sickness was suspected by all to be the result of neglecting his duties to the semi. The key act during the ritual involves sucking on selected parts of the patient's body, after which the shaman spat the ailment or sickness into his hands. Before sucking, the shaman hid inside the mouth a cotton-wrapped satchel enclosing a piece of meat and some bones. In other instances, these were small stones. The satchel of stones was the entity that enabled the shaman's sucking to extract and capture the sickness from the patient's body. The shaman then gave the satchel with the sickness safely wrapped to the cured patient and commanded him to take care of, quote, it, end quote, and, quote, it, end quote, was expressively designated by Pané as a semi. It is the face-to-face -face interaction between shaman and patient mediated through the semi-imbued satchel of stones that changed the patient's personhood vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the community from a socially marginalized, sick or sinner person to a once again healthy, productive member. Sickness was the partable, perhaps even permeable, component of the patient's body and persona that could be extracted and assumed and neutralized by the semi, that is, the satchel of stones through the sucking action of the shaman. As Fowler pointed out to me by Susan R Rasmussen and Piers Videpsky, sorry if I mispronounce these names, guys, um, 
But these people have dealt even more extensively with the same issues for respectively the Tuareg of Africa and the Sora of Eastern India. Both of these authors explored issues of boundaries of what sickness is and how it is treated among the Tuareg and the Sora, quote, both of whom seem to show strong concepts of the permeability of the body, end quote. Thus are the illuminating cross-cultural cross -cultural parallels between the Taino and Tuareg and Sora notions of partability and permeability in regard to sickness and curing. In the Hispaniolan case, intangible illness permeates from the patient to the satchel of stones by the sucking action of the shaman, who then gives the semi-imbued stones containing the captive or perhaps neutralized sickness to the care of the patient. Bané then notes that the Hispaniolan natives in general, quote, believe it is true that those stones are good, i.e. have supernatural powers, and they help women give birth, and they keep them very carefully, wrapped in cotton, putting them into small baskets, and they feed them some of what they eat, and they do the same thing with semis. These, or end quote, these, quote, an iconic, end quote, semis with curing as well as protecting powers then assume human-like qualities, such as having to be fed or prayed to. By, quote, an iconic, quote, I follow Alfred Gell's usage. An icon is defined by the concise Oxford Dictionary, first as, quote, a devotional painting of Christ or another holy figure, typically on wood, venerated in the Byzantine and other Eastern churches, end quote. And second, but more appropriately in this instance, as, quote, a person or thing regarded as a representative symbol or as worthy of veneration, end quote. Quote, an iconic, end quote, thus means that the, quote, thing, end quote, or, quote, person, end quote, in question is not a figure, i.e. formal representation of the entity in question. Yet, while not formally or anatomically resembling a figure of a thing or person, it is still nevertheless regarded as such. Examples of this include a wide range of objects, mostly magical, such as the pebbles noted in Panez account above, or the crystal quartz talismans or charms used by shamans in northwestern Amazonia, such as the Desana and Tucano. Another expression of individuality is fractality. The fractal person encapsulates the, encapsulates the personhood concepts of partability and multiple composition that are repeated or replicated at different scales, going from particular persons to larger social groups or collectivities, such as clans and lineages, and extending from the living to a non-living, quote, family, end quote, of beings, example, apical mythological ancestors. Citing Strathern's work in Highland, New Guinea, Melanesia, Fowler commented that, quote, just as people combine a diversity of relations, so clans combine a diversity of persons. The composite person exists in the same format at both scales, end quote, at the level of person and at the level of clan. In Fowler's words, um, quote, Strathern argues that gathering and ceremonies bring together a whole clan as a, as a individual person so that, quote, within the quote, the bringing together of many persons is just like the bringing together of one, end quote, within the quote. Anyway, both clans and individuals move between being one person with many relations or individual and or being presented as one of a pair in a relationship, partable. Unlike the single person, the clan is usually fragmented and partable, but becomes individual during social gatherings. The clan and the person, therefore, have parallel compositions and move between parallel conditions of personhood. In short, the clan, or sib, fratri, uh, moi, Moyeti is like a person. The clan and its members are each envisioned as a whole person. The individual and fractal quality of persons and personhood is well attested among Melanesian, quote, big and great men, end quote. Quote, exchanges between big men are exchanges between clans. Clans are equivalent, and so are all the persons within them, including the big men, end quote. The scale at which fractal personhood is taken beyond single persons into larger and diverse groupings, of course, varies from society to society. A Taino land example of a partable person is the famous ancestor semi-idol found in the 1880s in a cave near Maniel, a province of Barahona in Hispaniola. This is an anthropomorphic idol made of cotton and vegetable fiber cordage. The idol's head covers an actual human skull fragment seen only by x-ray, while the thorax or abdomen's cotton fabric is probably wrapped around a higuero or calabash, uh, crescencia cujete, or perhaps a block of wood. 
The human skull is thus embedded within, given a new face, and provided with an outer, uh, quote, skin, end quote, and body. Part of the deceased human is thus recomposed as a semiified ancestor, in short, a person. Wrapping and embedding a human skull is not uniquely a Dainoan notion and is in fact a prevalent mode of personhood present, uh, presentation throughout Oceania in societies such as the Maori. The dead human person's skull being recomposed and reconstituted as a semiified ancestor idol, i.e. given a new skin body, among other things, results in a new set of relations between the living descendant and the semiified ancestor. The clan slash, slash lineage is a person as much as the semiified idol is a person. Exchanges between living caciques or nitainos are exchanges between chiefly clans or lineages. One of the four classes of semi-icons noted in this book, the large stone head, is most likely the stone carved version of the semiified human skulls of ancestors kept in calabashes or wrapped in cotton idols. The human head semis, a kind of trophy head, made in stone and shell, have a long history in the Caribbean going back to the Saladoid and Huecoy period, around 400 to 200 BC. But at this early time, these trophy heads were limited to personally worn pendants, often made of marine shells or gemstones like serpentine. Only much later in time would these become large stone heads, no longer to be used for a personal adornment made of what to us Westerners seem to be ordinary and fairly abundant rock species. Chapter 5, Contrasting Animistic and Naturalistic Worldviews On the basis of available ethno-historic data, it can be argued that the historic Tainoan construction of personhood is fundamentally individual and partable, and it operates in the context of an animistic perception of the landscape, of the cosmos, Animism entails the belief that beings, things, objects, and so on all can potentially have a life force or energy, a soul or anima in its ancient Latin sense. Persons and personhood are con constituted in terms of social relations and interactions with other human and non-human beings, animals, spiritual and physical things, even landscapes in a particular way that anthropologists long ago labeled animism. In this animistic view, the cosmos is comprised of beings that have different natures, but, along with humans, share a unified cultural world. Both Felipe de Scola and Eduardo Viveiros de Castro have eloquently demonstrated that such a multinatural perspective predominates among many Amerindian societies of the South American tropical lowlands. It's a perspective grounded on the continuity of relationships between all things natural and cultural, in this view, the transformation of form is crucial to the interaction between beings, each assuming a form appropriate to the relationship in which it is engaged. In contrast, the contemporary Western naturalistic perspective is one whereby human society exists in a natural world. It's perceived as a series of different cultures within a unifying human nature. It is, as Fowler indicated, a multicultural natural perspective that, quote, creates an alienating discontinuity between what's perceived as a natural versus cultural phenomenon, end, quote, end, end quote. The identity of persons is fixed by species, example, linean taxonomy, rather than as a status of being or beings that is negotiable and where the relationship and interactions between people, animals, and things are dialogic. While in multinatural cultural or animistic perspective, transformations of form are vital to interaction between beings, in a multicultural, natural, or naturalistic world, Forms are propagated identically by natural reproduction from one generation to the next. In the animistic perspective, non-humans can be and often are persons who comprise a part of the human world. Nature is social and cultural, not just, quote, natural, end quote. Instead, in the Western naturalistic tradition, species are what constitute different social groups. Moreover, in an animistic perspective, human beings and other beings can also appear in forms other than their own, such as body transformations or transmutations. Thus, animals, objects, places, things, spirits, plants, animals, and even places in landscape can be person, persons or parts of persons. This view contrasts with the naturalistic perspective whereby the human world is the social world and diverse societies and cultures belong to, are part of, nature. A naturalistic perspective holds that only humans can be fully construed as persons, whereas animals, plants, objects, and places, quote, can only be thought of as persons in a whimsical or fantastic context, end quote. That is, quote, the metaphors between non-human and human are merely representational, end quote. As shall be seen later, 
A semi has multiple natures. It is manifested as or imbued in physical things like stone, wood, or trees, gold, bones, etc., and as phenomena displayed in nature, for example, hurricanes and floods, as well as in the created idols and icons. By virtue of the semis being engaged in social relationships with human beings in a variety of contexts, they're construed as persons, or anthropo which is uh, referred to as anthro an anthropomorphism, if I can get it out. And like human beings, these semis have names and titles, role, names and titles, roles marked by gender and age and social rank. They build up reputations and have a history of deeds based on their acts and relationships with human beings and with other beings and things in the cosmos. In other words, they have biographies. It's evident that not all semi entities were captivated and transformed into iconic slash and iconic images or artifacts. But hereafter, the focus of the study is on those semi forces and energies that were objectified into icons. Later in this book, I will deal with the question of whether semi objects can take on only a limited set of forms or archetypes and characteristics or quote personalities end quote, or if they're instead much more ambiguous and able to, for example, change gender form and so on, either within a certain range or in a limitless fashion. At this point, I can introduce a teaser. Some of these semi-objects are sculptured so that one body integrates or contains two or multiples of two persons. Thus, personhood changes by changing the perspective of the object relative to the viewer or vice versa. For example, in one perspective, the visible personage may be an anthropomorphic head while the zoomorphic per personage remains a cult. Again, rotating the semi-icon hides the human-like head and reveals the frog-like personage. The two distinct persons, frog and human, are nevertheless embodied in a single object. Classic art historians label this phenomenon as the Janus mode, and structurally, it's an expression of dualism. Hence, when a single sculpture, sculptural piece holds at once different morphologies, as is with the case with the human head versus the frog of persons, this is already an indication of the playful ways in which an icon can take on a specific set of traits, but at the same time hold another set of completely different ones. As shall be seen, one interesting and key notion involving the changing personhood of the same semi-icon revolves around the occult and the visible. It does have the same effect as a magician has on us when he pulls a rabbit out of a hat. It's magical. David Graeber has discussed the importance that magic, both the visible and the occult, has discussed the importance that magic, both the invisible and the occult, has in order to understand the power and potency of material objects and particularly the values attached to them and the performer by an audience. The many and changing natures of semis, now visible, now occult, are thus not only of a conceptual or mental kind, but are also skillfully rendered in a, in a wide range of material objects. The relative perspective of the semi-object and the viewer and how the person displays or holds the icon for contemplation by other humans thus provide a complex and dynamic environment for engaging in social relations. What are the relationships that semis have with human beings, especially semi-icons? What are the social and political, rel political religious implications of these relationships in regard to the spatial distribution, or web, of the large three-pointers, stone collars, stone elbows, and large stone heads. To address these questions, the first step is to define what the concept of semi refers to so that its material correlates the semi as artifact, so that, the mat so that its material correlates the semi as artifact can be understood. And we're scrolling to part two, the form, personhood, identity, and potency of semi-idols. Scrolling some more. Chapter 6. The semi reveals its personhood and its body form. The notion of semi finds similar, though not identical, analogs in other societies around the world, such as among the Bakongo of Western Africa, for whom bilongo, quote, medicine, end quote, is what animates and confers potency to their magic uh, wooden idols, minkisi. It is also analogous to the paired notions of mana and tapu or tabu in Polynesia or the hao and Maori couplet of the Maori of New Zealand. Semi thus relates to the notion of, quote, vital essence, end quote, that Raymond Firth discussed for the Maori long ago. The conceptual dyad, hao slash Maori, 
entails, quote, the assumption that behind any material form is an invisible dynamic power that makes it what it is, end quote. And all at once is, quote, the source of appearance and potential for action, which was from Maori philosophers seen as merely the inner expression of an inner nature, end quote. David Graeber's definition is applicable to my understanding of what semi is. To start, the Tainoan language term semi refers to an artifact or object, not to an artifact or object, but to an immaterial, numinous, and vital force. Under particular conditions, beings, things, and other phenomena in nature can be imbued with semi. Semi is therefore a condition of being, not a thing. It is a numinous power, a driving or vital force that compels action. It's the power to cause, to affect, and also denotes a condition or state of being. Among modern-day Arawakan, Northern Caribbean Maypuran speakers, the Lokono of Guiana and Suriname, semehi means something that is or tastes and smells sweet. The stem, seme or semi, can also be found in the word semichichi, a Lokono noun for, quote, shaman, end quote, or, quote, curer, end quote. Thus, in Lokono, seme is an adjective meaning, quote, sweetness, end quote, while semehi is the noun for, quote, sweet, end quote. Other things, especially fruits that have the condition of being sweet, also carry the seme or semi-morphine. Semeheyobali, a noun, is a sweet sage plant, lantakara, used by medicine men for curing, while semeto, translated as, quote, sweet one, end quote, is a noun for a vine, species unidentified that yields a sweet edible fruit. In short, most Lokono words with the morphine seme allude to shamanism or to curing or magical properties. It is no coincident that, coincidence that honey, along with the contrasting tobacco, is one of a key pair of opposing elementary concepts widely deployed in Amerindian mythology, famously analyzed by Claude Levi Strauss. In one part of his Mythologiques trilogy, as there were no honey-making bees in Hispaniola, mythology bestowed the sweet but astringent guava fruit, uh, Sidium guajava, with the same role that honey had for continental Amerindians. But under what conditions does a semi-materialize? Fray Ramon Pané, who was ordered by Christopher Columbus to investigate the religious beliefs and practices of the natives in Hispaniola, provided a detailed description of the context in which an ordinary human being from Hispaniola encounters that which is semi his report to Columbus, begun in 1494 and completed by 1498, stated, quote, The semis of wood were made in this way. When someone is walking along in the forest and he sees a tree that's moving its roots, the man very fearfully stops and asks it who it is, and it answers him, Summon me a behike, and he will tell you who I am. And when that man goes to the aforesaid physician, he tells him what he had seen, end quote. To an ordinary human being, the semi is manifested manifested by an unusual or uncommon sign in nature a tree moves its roots when ordinarily that's not expected to occur through a process of abduction the man reasons that the tree root is displaying a different nature it's something other than the ordinary root of a tree given the circumstances of the encounter it unexpectedly moved therefore it is semi abduction is a mode of co cognitive operation or inference employed in semiotics and logic discourse Gell defines abduction as, quote, a case of synthetic inference, end quote, and cites the definition given by Jay Holland and his colleagues, quote, abduction is induction in the service of explanation in which a new empirical rule is created to render predictable what would otherwise be mysterious. It is based on the logical fallacy of affirming the antecedent from the consequence. For example, if P, then Q, but Q, therefore P. Given true premises, it yields conclusions that are not necessarily true, end quote. One can surmise that other such uncanny manifestations in nature would also lead to similar abductive reasoning, such as when a person encounters a rock in a river where there was none the day before, or where one discovers a stone that has an unexpected shape or unusual characteristics for that place in that moment. At this point, however, the semi-manifestation still is pretty much an occult, unfound undefined entity to unveil its identity that is its personhood requires the specialized religious knowledge of a behike or cacique the naboria apparently lacks the skills for interpreting the numinous manifestations though not the ability to recognize its potential presence the next and crucial phase relates to the uncovering of the identity the personhood of a particular semi 
and the sorcerer or wizard runs at once to see the tree about which the other man has told him. He sits next to it and prepares a kohoba for it, the tree or root. Once the kohoba is made, that is, once the ceremony of inhaling hallucinogens is concluded, the shaman tells it all his titles, as if he were a great lord, and he asks it, Tell me who you are, and what you're doing here, and what you wish from me, and why you have had me summoned. Tell me if you want to be cut down, i.e. cut and sculptured, or if you want to come with me, and how you want to be carried, for I will build you a house with land. Then the tree, or semi, turned into an idol, or devil, answers him the manner in which he wants it to be done, and he, the shaman, cuts it and fashions it in the manner he had been ordered. He constructs a house with land, sick from Spanish heredad, meaning a cultivated garden, and many times during the year he, the shaman, prepares cojoba for it, the idol. Confirmations of the status and unveiling of the occult nature of this tree root or stone is done through the performance of a ceremony that involves the shaman's inhalation of a powerful hallucinogen known as cojoba. It is while in a state of altered consciousness that the semi in the tree root reveals its true nature, body form, and personhood. The revelations consist of vocalizing his names, titles, and genealogical ancestry, its body or idol form, and accoutrements the specific powers he or she can wield, and finally, the proper ritual forms and times of veneration. The semi-specific body form, whether iconic or aniconic, is revealed to the shaman during a hallucinatory trance, after which the shaman, or more likely a skilled Taino artisan, sculptures the tree, or rock, bone, etc., into an idol already invested with personhood. Henceforth, this particular semi-idol will be housed and revered. Cojoba ceremonies will be performed performed at prescribed times throughout the year and he or she will receive food offerings from the first harvest in other words the sculptured wood idol is thus invested with personhood and will henceforth be engaged in social relations with the human being to whom it is entrusted it is more than likely that three of the four classes of semi-artifacts noted three-pointed stones stone collars and elbow stones were produced in the same way described by pane once sculptured or unveiled revealed into an iconic or an iconic object, the semi-idol is to become linked with a particular human being who becomes its trustee or caretaker, and who must ensure compliance with the ritual and ceremonial requirements owed to the semi. Perhaps one ought to consider, too, that the semi-icon could also be conceived as a trustee or caretaker of its human, quote, partner, end quote, although there are no concrete ethno-historic references supporting this view. It seems that semi-icons had their own kin relations. They had genealogy and descent lines. Admiral Columbus's son, Hernando, or Ferdinand, wrote that, quote, they give a name to this statue. I believe that it's that of the father, grandfather, or of both, because they have more than one and others more than ten names in memory, as I have said, of some of their ancestors, end quote. One legend told of Guarionesh, a paramount cacique of Hispaniola, who was entrusted with Yucahuguama Baguama Orocoti, the highest ranking of all semi-idols recorded by Pané. This Yucahu had a, quote, mother, end quote, named Atabe Yermao Apitos Wimaco, who was the highest ranking female of all the semis recorded by Pané. A major distinct class of semi-artifacts distinct class of semi-artifacts refers to those, quote, that contain the bones of their, the Tainos, fathers and mothers and relatives and ancestors. They are made of stone or wood, end quote. And as noted earlier, also enclosed in full-bodied cotton, full cotton idols or held in calabash bowls or baskets. This class of semi-ancestor idol, idols does have a direct descent linkage with surviving human beings, as well as, I presume, with other deceased relatives that have also become semiified. Thus, the semi-idols are in a web of kinship and descent that binds set idols, sets of idols among themselves and, in the case of ancestor idols, with living human beings. Therefore, two types of relationships existed, the sort of patron-client relationships between human trustee and the semi-idols and those binding relationships grounded on kinship. The former type, for example, entails transactions where semis, the, quote, patrons, end quote, deliver favors or good to their non-kin human, quote, end quote, I mean, quote, clients, end quote, in exchange for, for example, ritual food offerings. The latter type is based upon the mutual reciprocal obligations defined by kinship, such as between ancestors and their descendants, husbands and wives, uncles and nieces, and so forth. 
The bodily transformation of the semi, for example, from amorphous stone to three-pointer is not restricted to just portable objects. I have argued elsewhere that the petroglyphs carved on monoliths demarcating plazas or bar co ball courts or carved and painted on the walls of caves, on boulders and rivers, and in other localities in the landscape or rock art should also be regarded as semi-icons or idols whose form and personal identities were uncovered and captivated in the same way as described by Panay for the tree root. These are all fixed in space and for all practical reasons unmovable, although it may be technically possible for the large Bate monoliths to be moved by the natives to other localities, even across islands, I suspect these occasions, if they ever happen at all, would be extremely rare. Spatially fixed semi-icons can be found in open areas that are visible to the public, such as plazas, river boulders, and rock cliffs, and also in closed environments such as caves. Like the large cane of the cacique, activities taking place in caves are not in view of the general public. Both appear to be more intimate, restricted spaces. The immobility of the semi-icons, which are often monumental, declares that the scenario, the landscape, be it cave, rock cliff, river pool, spring, or plaza, is itself a circumscribed or self-contained sacred domain that is inhabited, guarded, occupied by these semi-personages. While portable icons could be arranged and rearranged according to the requirements of the ritual, the fixed monumental icons in plazas and in rivers, rock shelters, or caves could not. How such fixed monumental semi-icons differ from portable ones in terms of their meanings, ritual function, and especially in their relationship with human beings is a subject that deserves further study. For example, later, when the giving and theft of semis is examined, it will become apparent that non-portable icons cannot be gifted or stolen without relinquishing space itself. Thus, such fixed icons do not circulate through a web. Human beings come to them. The focus in this book, however, is on the portable semi-icons, leaving the discussion of monumental, non-portable semi-icons for another time. Chapter 7 7. Semi-idols and Tainoan idolatry. What is striking among the various Spanish chroniclers is that they all coincide in the diversity of forms that both iconic and aniconic objects imbued with semi could assume and in the varied media form from which they were made. Fray Ramon Pané makes it clear that the semi-objects slash idols came in different shapes and were made of stone, wood, and other materials. Example, human skulls, bones, and meat bits. Indeed, the chronicler Oviedo, with his characteristic and vulgar ethnocentrism, stated that the natives in Hispaniola and neighboring islands venerate the devil, shaped in diverse forms and idols, and, as I have said before, in many things they paint and carve and sculpture it in wood and clay and in other materials. They make a demon that they call semi, so ugly and as scary as the devil, that Catholics paint at the feet of Archangel St. Michael or Apostle St. Bartholomew referring to wood idols, but the semi is not tied with change as St. Bartholomew's devil. Instead, it is venerated. Sometimes it is seen seated in a tribunal, probably a duhor seat, but maybe also be a platform of some sort. Other times, it is standing on its feet, and we see it in different manners or poses. Oviedo further notes, I have never found in this generation of people such ancient tradition, painted, sculptured, or carved relief in so highly revered image than that abominable and garish devil painted, depicted in many and diverse ways or sculptured or de bulto with volume, with many heads and tails, with deformities and so scary and with fierce fangs and dentures or teeth and with large canine teeth and disproportionate ears with burning dragon eyes, a reference to shiny shell or gold inlays, and as fierce a serpent and in many different forms to such an extent that the least scary looking one commands fear and admiration. And these semi-images are so sociable and commonplace for them that not only do they have a place to display them in the house, but even more so in the benches where they, where they seat that they call duhos, meaning that he who sits, a human being, is not alone seating. But he and his adversary, i.e. the semi-image carved on the man's seat, and in wood and in clay and in gold and in other things, as many as they can, they sculpture and call, carve or paint, snarling and fierce face as who he is, i.e. the devil. Most of these idols were subjected to some form of veneration or another. What the Taino did with these idols, in effect, constituted idolatry, 
but in the sense originally intended by this word and as reinstated by Alfred Gell, I concur with Gell that, quote, all idols, I think, are iconic, including the so-called aniconic ones, whether or not they look like some familiar object, such as a human body, end quote. I applaud Gell's reinstatement of the word quote, idolatry, end quote, which, quote, has had a bad press since the rise to world domination of Christianity and Islam, which have both inherited the anti-imagistic strain of biblical Judaism. Christianity, encumbered by its Greco-Roman inheritance, has had to struggle more actively with recrudescence of de facto or pagan idolatry and has experienced cataclysmic episodes of iconoclasm, end quote. Islam has been more consistent and persistent in its iconoclastic posture, but Muslim, as opposed to Islam, art, has not always been entirely devoid of religious iconic representations, including the Prophet Muhammad. For example, the Muslim art of medieval Persia, today's Iran, has such depictions in various mosques and, place, and palaces. The, idol, the idol's body form, which Gell calls the, quote, index, end quote, even when visual, visualized by the native shaman via hallucinatory revelations, given by the semi-spirit, is nevertheless based on Tainuan artistic conventions on a, quote, prototype, end quote, in the sense denoted by Gell. Body form and decoration, or the looks, provide the visual cues for rec recognition by the believers of who a given semi is. The formal visual cues emerge from a mental vision of what this semi looks like, and conversely, that mental image is the prototype or blueprint that the body of the image or icon materially assumes. As Gell noted in regard to prototypes, one can take the Goodmanian assertion that, quote, any given icon, given appropriate or symbolic conventions for reception, example, dog means canine animal in English, could function as a representation of any arbitrarily selected depiction or referent, end quote, a view that parallels the Caesurian postulate of the arbitrary nature of the sign in linguistic semiotic theory. Gell, however, rejects Goodman's view and instead argues that any, quote, iconic representation is based on the actual assemblance in form between depictions and the entities they depict or are believed to depict, end quote, my emphasis. He goes on to assert that, quote, a depiction of an imaginary thing, a god, for instance, resembles the picture that believers in that god have in their minds as to the god's appearance, example, the three-pointed form of the semi in our case, which they have derived from other images of the same God, which this image resembles, end quote, and concludes by indicating that, quote, what matters to me is only that people believe that the God as agent has caused the image or index as patient to assume a particular appearance, end quote, that even in the case of highly schematic representations, quote, only very few features of the entity being depicted need to be present in order to motivate abductions by the viewer from the index, example, idol, as to the, as to the appearance in a much more completely specified form of the entity depicted. Recognition on the basis of a few, of a few underspecified clues is not the same as not specified at all or purely conventional, end quote. The sculpted semi-idol, Gell's God, the shape and form it shows, along with the specific cues of style and decoration, is what the natives believe to be the form of the numinous entity and is revealed by the entity to the shaman through the Kohoba hallucination. What matters is that this entity, the semi, is the agent, example, tree root, river rock, cave stalagmite, that causes the idol or icon to assume this particular form and not another. The four classes of stone semis have distinct sculptural forms, three-pointed shapes, angular or elbow stones, oval or ring shapes, and human-like head shapes. Other forms can also be distinguished as distinct classes in the very corpus of sculptural art, such as, quote, canopied, end quote, cohoba idols, dujos, and vomiting spatulas, and made of such diverse materials as cotton, wood, bone, guanine, or a gold-copper alloy, and shell. Each idol shape is recognized as an index of a given semi-prototype. But the specific identity of any singular icon is another matter. Personal identity is no doubt based on subtle but discriminating visual cues recognized by the native believers, but that I, as an uninitiated Westerner, may not be able to recognize. Chapter 8. Semis and Personal Identities 
Consider the three-pointed idols in discussing the issue of identity and representation. There are many singular icons that assume the elemental three-lobed form, but that can be further distinguished on the basis of variations in details. Among such differentiating features are details like whether or not they are simple, undecorated icons, whether the card facial features are human or animal-like, whether the biomorphic faces are carved on the rising cone or the lateral prominences, whether they are large, small, or miniature, and so on. Do these idols each represent and embody a different semi-spirit, or are these different versions or aspects of the same semi-quote divinity, end quote? Improving on the typology first proposed by Jesse Walter Fuchs, Jeff Walker defined four basic formal types of three-pointed idols. Of course, such typology is based purely on morphology and does not pretend to reflect an emic classification. Still, questions arise. Are these four types slightly different versions of the same semi-prototype? Are they the form recognized by the natives to be the same numinous, unsubstantiated semi-spiritual force or entity? Or is each formal type a manifestation of four or more different semi-prototypes? These are unresolved questions. It may be that all three-pointed stones, despite small or large variation in detail, are based on the same prototype. They all embody the same semi-spiritual force that was manifested in nature, visually cued by cued by its basic three-lobed three form. The three-lobed form is the identifying criterion. Alternatively, the different features and details of three-pointed idols are visual cues that refer to different prototypes. That is, each of these three-pointed icons embodies a different semi-spiritual entity. In this last case, one could reason that the details, rather than the overall form, are what matter. But there might be a third possibility, that the essence of a, semi of a specific semi-manifestation is visually cued by the three-lobed form, that all three-lobed forms are shapes that signal the same numinous power source, in other words, a specific, quote, sweet, end quote, or semi-spirit. These forms may possibly extend not just to the three-pointed sculptured idols, but also to the perhaps sacred landscape. The three-pointed limestone hill, or mogotes, clusters that are so prominent in the karst regions of Puerto Rico. The three-pointed form is totally, is totally different from, for example, stone heads, stone collars, dujos, and anthropomorphic cotton ancestor idols, or the actual skills, skulls rather, in baskets of semiified ancestors, which definitively suggests that such formal categories are based on different prototypes. However, in all of these semi-categories, the additional details and features of decoration and style are what provide the visual cues for the recognition of particular, even singular, entities. Given Panay's bi biographic synopses of the 12 known semis from Hispaniola, it is clear that each idol was regarded by the natives as a singular distinct personage, but in the animistic multinatural tradition, with a specific personhood that included the names, titles, and rank, and coming with the legend attached to that, and only that idol, or index. Not all 12 idols were given descriptions of their body forms, but those that were have different iconic shapes, and hence refer to different prototypes. In short, all the evidence points to one conclusion. Each singular semi-icon con constitutes a distinct, differentiated personage, even when all are three-pointed stones, for example, or all are elbow stones. Recall that the small, some miniature-sized, three-lobed form with barely any decorations, begins in pre-Arawak and continues through Saladoy times. Its lack of distinguishing features, its lack of distinguishing features, it began as a faceless icon, may be indicative of a more generic identity, but, at, but by at least 8900, these generic, more homogenous icons are joined by a suite of large, highly decorated ones with stylistic features, with faces, that allow one to establish their identity. The latter diverge from a small generic or undifferentiated semi-entity to a suite of three-pointers that are stylistically differentiated. They evolved from, quote, faceless things, end quote, to distinct, quote, faced beings, end quote. In essence, this is a process of, quote, anthropomorphization, end quote, that makes sense when one realizes that the Taino and locus of the soul of both the living, Guaisa, and the dead, Opia, 
is in the face of a living human, or the head, i.e. skull, of a deceased person, as shall be discussed later. That the, quote, face, end quote, is selected for identity is also logical, because it's not only where most details of identity are found, but it's also where emotions are expressed, making us human. The total lack of such details and emotions, as in the case of the head or, quote, face, end quote, of a skull, is, of course, the absence of what of that which makes us alive, the guaisa. But even the skeletal face of a three-pointed stone or a makoris-type head has an identity because it's still fueled by a vital force or semi, only it's not of the living but the non-living being, animated by its opia. A legitimate question raised by Fowler is whether the same, quote, originary, end quote, semi-spirit might proliferate several identical versions of itself, revealed as icons, that then may lead their own lives, but that in some way link back to the disembodied semi, i.e. a spirit accessible via hallucinatory experiences. The ethnohistoric documents do not describe what or who the natives saw during hallucinatory trances, nor do they tell us whether the icons had a specific disembodied spiritual counterpart in the dreamy hallucinatory world. I would speculate that the same semi-spirit can probably reveal itself, as narrated in the account by Panet, more than once. Perhaps this would explain why, for example, archaeologists can group three-pointers into several types, each of which depicts fairly similar, though not identical, kinds of personages. Example, beaky birds, bats, high-ranked anthropomorphic beings, etc. Still, the available evidence is insufficient to take this matter beyond an educated guess. Once a semi is objectified, personal identity is established by the fact that the biography slash legend imputed to any singular icon can only be so constructed on its de facto relationship with human beings. In other words, in the hypothetical case of, say, two exactly duplicate semi icons, there is the inescapable fact that through their life history, each semi idol will engage with different human beings, be asked to act upon different peoples beings and things under differing circumstances and their actions would have various varying effects making of each a distinct person a semi being with a unique biography legendary tales about each semi as told and retold by natives are the result of specific interactions between a given semi and the human beings with whom it has related to as agent in many transactions throughout the lifetime of the idol even after a semi-idol escapes from his human trustee forever, as was the case of Opiel Guobirang, the legend survived, although his bio biography ceased to accrue. As Pané noted, quote, they never saw him again, nor did they hear anything about him, end quote. Examples of these semi-legends come biographies collected by Pané will be examined in the following sections. All the 12 semis for which their legends are known show certain behaviors that are human-like. These idols are thus anthropomorphic. However, this doesn't necessarily mean that all are displaying in the physical shape or semblance of a human figure, but more that they're imputed with a wide range of behaviors that are normally ascribed to ordinary biological humans, whether these look like living human, humans and animals, iconic or not, and iconic. Animals, stones, tree roots, shells, bones, all can potentially be imbued with the animated force of semi-sweetness. Their relations with humans are anthropomorphic. A distinction must be made between human-like behavior and the capacity or power to act. The latter is where an icon has capabilities that are extraordinary beyond that of mere mortals. It has quote-unquote sweetness. It's imbued with semi. The icon or idol is, quote, animated, end quote, by semi. But a human shaman or cacique can also transcend the ordinary and be, be capable of extraordinary feats, but only through the relations he or she establishes with the semi and the execution of appropriate rituals, such as the kohova ceremony. Indeed, the inhalation of the hallucinogen is what changes the ordinary human nature of this human into, the locono, into what the Locono called semichichi, a uh, shaman or medicine man, but for which the Taino provided a lexical innovation, a beike. As Gale noted, the attribution of animism and anthropomorphism on a wood or stone idol is not the same as attributing it with biological life in order to define, quote, animacy, quote, in terms of volition, intentionality, or sensorial capabilities. 
In this regard, it's worth paraphrasing Alfred Gale in extenso. He wonders about how, quote, representational indexes, and quote, i.e. idols, can be apprehended as, quote, social others, as repositories of agency and sensibility, end quote, which to modern Westerners has the appearance of irrational beliefs and practices. Gell points out that it is irrational, if not downright strange, to a Westerner that believers speak to, dress and bathe, or feed an idol rather than a living and breathing human being. Just as aware of its strain, strangeness and irrationality as our Westerners are those who engage in such behavior, the believers. But in contrast, notes Gell, the latter also hold, quote, that the cult of the idol is religiously efficacious and will result in benefits for themselves and the masters they serve in their capacity as priests, end quote, or shamans. Gell goes on to say that it is not a case where believers and shamans cannot distinguish between, quote, stocks and stones, end quote, but rather that in certain contexts, these objects are thought to have, quote, unusual occult properties of which the religiously uninstructed would remain ignorant and the instructed but skeptical wrongheadedly incredulous, end quote. The attribution of, quote, intentional psychology, end quote, or of volition to religious idols survives and prospers precisely because it is, quote, odd and counterintuitive, end quote. For Gell, the key issue to be considered is the, quote, unusual occult capacities that idol possesses according to believers, end quote. Furthermore, what we need to know is how idol worshippers square the circle between, quote, what they know, end quote, and what we know they know, and what they know about persons and their capacities as intentional agents. They cannot confuse the two, but it remains possible that human persons have attributes which can also be possessed by stocks and stones without prejudice to their categorical difference from human persons. That is to say, quote, social agents, end quote, can be drawn from categories as different as chalk and cheese because, quote, social agency, end quote, is not defined in terms of, quote, basic, end quote, biological attributes, such as inanimate thing versus incarnate person, but it is, but is relational. It does not matter in ascribing, quote, social agent, end quote, status, what a thing or a person, quote, is, end quote, in itself. What matters is where it stands in a network of social relations. All that may be necessary for stocks and stones to be, quote, social agents, end quote, in the sense we require is that there should be actual human slash persons, quote, in the neighborhood, end quote, of these inert objects, not that they should be biologically human persons themselves. To follow up on Gail's advice, I will consider what occult capacities these semi-idols possess as intentional agents. According to Taino and believers, that is from an emic perspective and quote, where they stand in a network of social relations, end quote. Part three, the social relations and circulation of semi-idols and human beings. So we're going to scroll a couple pages, maybe just one or two. And chapter nine, the power and potency of the semis. The semi-artifacts are social agents of causality as much as living human beings are. Each semi-icon has specific definable powers that were either highly beneficial or extremely dangerous for human society. Some examples follow. A semi-icon named by Brahma had the power to call Ill cause illness to human beings. Another, a stone idol named Guabansesh, had the power to order and unleash violent wind and rainstorms. This feminine stone semi-idol had two assistants, also made of stone. One was named Guatriquie, who, on Guabansesh's orders, quote, commanded all the other semis from that province to assist in causing a great deal of wind and rain, end quote, while the other, Guatava, gathered all the rainfall, quote, and let it run to ravage the country, end quote. Other semi-idols had benign powers, such as the unnamed but explicit, explicitly described by Pane as, quote, three-pointed stone, end quote, semis that cause yuca, manihan asculenta, to grow. Pane, writing on the different kinds of semis, noted that some made of stone or wood, quote, contained the bones of his father and his mother and relatives, end quote. Some others, quote, could speak, end quote. And others could, quote, make the things to eat, grow, others that make rain, others that make wind, others that are the best for aiding pregnant women give birth, end quote. 
One also learns of the other kinds of powers possessed by semis from what caciques, shamans, and others wished to obtain from them. The caciques kept these diabolical images in their houses, canelles, in selected dark places and locations that were reserved for prayer. There they, in, they entered to pray and asked for what they wished, be it water for their fields and cultivated gardens, for a good harvest, or for victory against their enemies. In some, and there was the old Indian who answered what the semi told him to his taste or liking, and he would enter the enter and speak with it and since he the shaman was an ancient astrologer or diviner he would tell them the other people present what day it would rain and other things and when war should be carried or delayed and without consultations with the presence of the devil or semi-idol they neither embarked nor did anything that was of importance and that was a quote from Oviedo if one reads carefully, the legends, all are quite fragmentary, attached to each of these 12 semi-idols recorded by Pané, several important characteristics of personal identity and personhood emerge. The first is that most, though not all, of these semi-icons are differentiated according to gender principles, masculine, feminine, asexual. Second, each idol has a set of personal names or titles that are indicative of status and rank, Differences between the known semis, the more names and titles, the higher the status. Third, they had gene genealogical ties to other semi-entities or to living human descendants. Fourth, all had specific capabilities and powers to alter or cause future events, some of which were related to weather control. The power of semis is thus not a generalized or abstract force, but one that has specific immediacy among the living and in nature. Fifth, all semi-idols were entrusted to a living human being. Sixth, in most instances, Bonnet records that a given semi-idol would circulate through successive human trustees. This was the case for the semi-corocote, who was first in Cacique Guamarete's house, then passed on to another unnamed cacique, and finally ended up with Cacique Guatabanesh of the Jaragua region in Hispaniola. Seventh, and finally, in several of the recorded legends, the semi had the capacity to escape from or abandon its human trustee. This comes very close to free will. Or volition, the capacity for autonomous decision-making and action that is independent of its human trustee. Human, quote, ownership, end quote, was not guaranteed, hence my frequent use of the word, quote, trustee, end quote, rather than, quote, owner, end quote. This capacity to flee and abandon plays a key role in the making or breaking of caciques. Those leaders who were perceived to be inept, who were, who were unable to control or negotiate the semis entrusted to them, could potentially be, quote, abandoned, end quote, by their semi-idol, temporarily or forever, as has hap as happened in the legend of the semi opiel guobirang. Thus, one might say that the human and his or her idol are companions of sorts but I suspect it's a tense, sometimes dangerous relationship because these idols can do as much good as evil, bringing about gentle fertilizing rain or destructive floods. In analogy to their human counterparts, semi-idols were also hierarchically, hierarchically structured. They were ranked and stratified. semi Guabansesh, as noted earlier, was a high-ranked feminine personage that had two subordinate or auxiliary semis named Coatrique and Guataba. One of these, Coatrique, was ordered to, quote, call all other semis, end quote, in the province, meaning that he or she was in charge of putting into effect Guabansesh's orders. The interaction between these semis parallel the human social hierarchical order whereby the cacique is the one who commands. The Nitaino, or elite advisors, are in charge of putting the orders into motion, while the Navoria, or commoners, are those who actually implement or execute them. The Guabansesh stone idol was, quote, in the country of a great cacique, one of the principal caciques, whose name was Almatesh, end quote. It was the living cacique, Almatesh, who was entrusted with the Guabansesh semi-idol. Hence, a high-ranked and potent semi is engaged in social relationship with, most specifically, a human person of similar rank to whom it was entrusted. For example, Guarianesh was mentioned earlier in section 6 as being an important cacique of Hispaniola who was entrusted with Yucahu Guama Baguamaurocoti, the highest ranking of all masculine semi-idols recorded by Pané. 
as noted, the semi-idol also had the power to run away from its trustee on its own accord. Two slightly different examples of this will suffice. Quote, the semi opiel guobirang has four feet, like a dog, they say, and is made of wood, and often at night he leaves the house and goes to the jungle. They went to look for him there, and they brought him home. They would tie him with rope, but he would return to the jungle. And they tell that when the Christians arrived on the island of Hispaniola, the semi escaped and went to a lagoon, but they never saw him again, nor did they hear anything about him. End quote. In the second example, rather than the idol running away for good from his trustee, it escapes from a conflagration. End quote. They say that when they built the house of Guamarete, who was a preeminent man, they placed the semi that he kept on top of his house. This semi was called Corocote. And once when they, the natives, were at war among themselves, Guamarete's enemies burned the house in which the aforementioned semi Corocote was located. They say he got up and walked the distance of a crossbow shot away from that place next to some water, end quote. From the moment the shaman in hallucinatory trance exposes who Semi is and what he or she looks like, it's clear that the entity is already invested with specific powers. Somehow, I do not think the sacred power of the Semi idol will decrease or increase over its lifetime. The, quote, sweetness, quote, force, Semi, is imbued in this idol from its inception. As well, from the start, the rank of the semi-idol is revealed, but it may in time acquire new titles or names as its reputation grows, just as caciques were bestowed titles as their reputations grew. I suggest that over the lifetime of the semi-idol, his or her prestige and reputation will grow with the steady accumulation of acts and deeds that can only come with time, the stuff out of which legends and thick or long and sentimented biographies are made. Antique senior semi-idols will be far more reputable, coveted, and valued than newly minted ones. Highly prestigious semi-idols cannot be newly sculptured on demand and at the whim of ambitious politicians, caciques or itainos. Even ordinary people will be aware that such a new icon, even if it were of a high rank and powerful, has yet to demonstrate how effective it is and likewise that the cacique has the wherewithal to control and extract benefits from that semi-idol to lead to a good government. The human trustee's reputation, seniority, and knowledge must be up to the task. The trustee must be able to show people that he or she can control, manipulate, negotiate, and even cajole the semis to yield and direct their powers to the trustees and society's advantage, a fruitful marriage, victory in war, a great harvest, and so on. The effectiveness of the icon is thus tied to that of the human trustee. A car a Corollary implication is that a semi-icon does not automatically increase prestige throughout its lifetime. That would depend on its relationship with its human trust trustee and what the latter can accomplish in concert with the given semi-icon. A newly minted semi-idol, on the other hand, has yet to accrue a biography or legend that enhances the idol's prestige and reputation. A newly minted, high-ranked semi-idol in the hands of a neophyte cacique a neophyte cacique can potentially be doubly worrisome in the eyes of the community. The heir, who has recently come into chiefly office and who will inherit at least some of the semi-idols from the deceased cacique, will find him or herself having to demonstrate whether, as a trustee, he or she will have the ritual knowledge and capabilities to efficiently engage with the contingent of powerful semi-items of different ranks and different accrued reputations. One can only imagine how stressful the death of powerful caciques would be for society. And chapter 10. So I think we're about at the one hour mark. So I'm going to go ahead and stop reading here. And um, we will pick up at chapter 10 in the next video.